Okay, let's get started, guys. Uh, thank you all for joining me today. Our guest is Simon Dixon from Bank to the Future. Now, today's topic is going to be El Salvador and the enormous amount of news coming out of there regarding uh, foreign investment. Simon, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Delighted to be all here. Right, so it's a pleasure. Hey, look, um, you've been around for quite some time, but uh, you're not as high profile as a lot of other people are, save for the recent Celsius um, debacle. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've been around for a while? So can you tell us what you've been doing in this space and also your background professionally as well? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm, I'm kind of the behind the scenes guy that gets called when things are in disaster. Um, so I've been at the monetary reform game for two decades now. Um, I uh, studied as an economist, mastered in economics, um, and just hated everything I learned and had to self-teach myself Austrian economics. Um, but then went into the world of investment banking, worked as a market maker on the London Stock Exchange, um, then worked as a stockbroker, and then worked in corporate finances, uh, taking companies public um, on the uh, alternative investment markets. Um, about 2006, I left to follow my passion, which was sharing the world about what a Ponzi scheme and fraud banking is. Um, and uh, so I started giving lectures around the world on that topic. Um, and uh, no one would listen because no one cared about fractional reserve banking. No one would believe me that banks created money. Um, and just quite frankly, no one gave a shit. Um, but then 2007 happened. Um, the financial crisis broke out. And uh, I was um, invited to speak uh, or support various countries with initiatives. Um, it became very clear that we were going to solve the problem with the cause of the problem, roll up more debt, um, and not use this as an opportunity to implement some hard monetary systems. So very despondent, um, actually went out and tried to create a bank. And uh, that was the foundation of Bank to the Future. Uh, we failed miserably um, because uh, the Bank of England said they wouldn't put someone like us in charge um, of a bank. Um, they said we couldn't do it the way we wanted. It couldn't be built upon hard money. Um, you had to build it on top of another bank. And so therefore it would be fractional reserve by default. Even if you tried to do it via custody, you'd have to custody via a bank. Um, and so uh, I, I actually just went completely deep in debt um, and uh, failed miserably and decided to, um, it, a bit depressed, um, started writing a book on the future of finance um, to try and support um, that. And that was the first published book in the world that actually included Bitcoin. It was published in, I wrote it in 2010 and it was published in 2011. Um, and uh, we pivoted Bank to the Future rather than focusing on banking laws because they weren't going to change. Uh, we focused on securities laws. And so in the UK, it took us three years to change the securities laws in the UK. Um, out of that came something called equity crowdfunding. Um, and then President Obama saw uh, what we did in the UK and reformed the 1933 Securities Laws Act to the Jobs Act. Um, and uh, armed with that, we started uh, funding Bitcoin companies. I spoke at the first Bitcoin conference. Um, our first investment was BitPay. We then did Coinbase, Kraken, Bitfinex, Bitstamp, Ripple Labs, um, Circle, um, and uh, we built a platform where Bitcoiners could uh, um, invest in these companies. So we um, focus on equity. And uh, we've now done about 1.7 billion of investment in the sector. Um, and we have a secondary market for the largest companies um, in Bitcoin. And um, uh, sorry, I could, go, I could go on a few stories, but they might. No, no, it's really interesting, well, actually. So. Uh, it's really um, interesting. Go, go, keep going if you like, um, but I'm, yeah, I'm happy do... to pick that up. I'll do a few more that, that kind of bring us to where we are. And then I think it's the complete background. Sure. Um, so in uh, 2014, we we're invited by the Isle of Man government, to, um, which was essentially trying to make Bitcoin legal tender um, in 2014. And so we were invited there to support the government. Uh, the reason that happened is because um, I had a really bad experience with the next prime minister, Boris Johnson, um, gave him a whole Bitcoin strategy. Uh, was invited to um, share it um, and uh, shared about how you could create jobs and recover. Uh, and he created a campaign which plagiarized our brand called Bust to the Future. 
Um, and then he invested in our competition, 30 million in co- uh, government money into our competition that wasn't supporting Bitcoin um, based funding. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just a, a really unpleasant experience. So um, we went over to Isle of Man to see if we could do it there. And uh, the government really liked it. So um, the government started putting all the wheels in motion. Um, and then uh, right at the last minute, after about a year of getting everything set up, uh, the Bank of England contacted the regulators and said, if you support this initiative, uh, we're going to remove clearing um, of the banking system to your island. Um, so they didn't stand up against the Bank of England, the banks lobbied, and um, that initiative failed. Uh, so, uh, but fortunately, Bitcoin became a really big thing. Um, and uh, so we just started focusing on pooling together funding for all the companies that couldn't get VC funding, uh, companies like Kraken and Bitstamp and various other ones. Um, and uh, we started doing lots of innovation. So in 2015, we launched a bond that was backed by Bitcoin mining. Um, and uh, we created Bitcoin retirement plans so that people could put uh, Bitcoin uh, securities within their retirement plans. Um, and uh, those came turned out to be some of the most successful investments on our platform. Um, and then we hit another roadblock. So uh, 2016 came along and uh, Bitfinex was um, hacked for 119,000 bit. Uh, we get the call. And so we put together a recovery plan for Bitfinex. Um, and that was uh, issuing a token on top of Bitcoin that was a security convertible that represented a debt and could be converted into equity. Um, That successfully launched and uh, Bitfinex recovered, paid out hundreds of millions in dividends throughout the bull market that happened afterwards. Um, And uh, the equity went up from 30 cents, so it's low to $16 on the Bank of the Future platform. Um, And it recovered Bitfinex and investors that took the bet um, did really well. Led to the bull market. Uh, obviously, Tether became a thing at that stage. And then Binance became the largest exchange because they didn't need banking and they used the rest of the bank. Um, and that led to a, a bit of a recovery. And then ICOs uh, came along, um, disrupted us. No one wanted to invest in equity because everyone was issuing unlicensed securities on um, Ethereum. And uh, so then we, we uh, had to put together a compliant way for uh, Bitcoin-based securities to be issued. Uh, That took several years, and um, now we get the call um, when the next disasters happened, which is the blow up of the yield. Um, In January this year, we um, I got a I went over to El Salvador um, to try and um, support the Bitcoin bond because we actually already did it in Iceland in 2014, so it was much much smaller and it wasn't sovereign, Um, but it was uh, based upon mining rigs that use geothermal clean energy based upon volcanoes in Iceland and uh, cooling in um, I, uh, natural cooling in Iceland as well. And that was uh, uh, the bond that we launched in 2014. So when we have heard about the Bitcoin bond from like Samson, Max and Blockstream and everyone, uh, we came over instantly to support the finance minister in seeing how we could um, make that initiative come out compliant because we'd just been at it for so long with securities laws. Um, and uh, then, yeah, we got the bringing us to present day. We get the Celsius scenario and uh, various other things. I'm under NDA, so um, in both in both those projects at the moment. So there's things that is public information that I'll be able to share, and there's things that are non-public that I won't be able to share. Um, but my our, our latest project is trying to put the two together and make a disaster into an opportunity uh, based around this uh, this decade of work that's gone behind it. Uh, excellent. Look, t- today's topic is obviously going to be about El Salvador, but Simon touched on something that I just want to pick up on because um, a lot of people don't know I've got a major in finance. And when I was uh, studying at university, there was absolutely zero mention of fractional reserve banking. Um, <laughs> when did you first yeah. become aware that, that that was how banking worked? Because uh, it took me <laughs> years after graduation and uh, I, I didn't believe it when people tried to tell me because, oh, no, I've just studied this. Nobody mentioned anything about it. So how did you come, come to be aware of it and uh, when did you realize it? Yeah, so, um, you know, when you're in economics, um, you're, you're taught classical and Keynesian economics and uh, you, you have to fight to get into this fringe um, side class called uh, Austrian economics. 
Um, and if you're lucky enough to get into the side class, you might learn about the gold standard and hard money um, and economics before, um, you know, the, the Fiat Ponzi scheme was really um, rehypothecated badly. So in classical economics, you're taught about, you know, the free market, um, but that later became the Chicago School. And the Chicago School really focused on, you know, kind of reducing tax and using monetary policy in order to stimulate economies. Um, and Keynesian uh, does the opposite, which is that in bad times, uh, you're meant to stimulate the economy through government debt. Uh, but everyone forgets the second part of Keynesian economics, which is in the good times, you're meant to pay down the debt. Um, but we continue. So you don't even get Keynesian economics. It's been really misunderstood. Um, and uh, it, it wasn't until I left university and uh, started working in banking that um, I did an interview with a guy called Bill Steele, who created a documentary called The Money Masters. And it was, you know, you put it in the conspiracy theory bucket. Um, but then you read books like The Creature from Jekyll Island um, and you, you start to realize that um, in history, throughout history, you know, some of the biggest wars were fought over this um, issue of uh, who controls the money supply. Um, and so that really took me down the rabbit hole. And um, I wrote the book Bank to the Future. And uh, recently I've gone 5,000 years down the money rabbit hole of helping people understand the trends today by looking at monetary history and just following the money. When you follow the money, you get the answers. Um, and so, yeah, uh, in economics, they teach you something called a multiplier effect. And it's not really taught like fractional reserve banking. Um, and the multiplier effect doesn't actually work. So they change it with um, bank regulations through reserve requirements and asset things that are just changed over time. And then um, yeah, you, you go down the rabbit hole and you kind of have to combine, cons before Bitcoin anyway, you had to combine conspiracy theory with economics and then reading geeky papers like Bank Charter Acts, put it all together. Um, but nowadays, you know, you just use Bitcoin and then you learn, oh shit, you can own your own money. That's different to banking. You can spend your own money. Oh, that's different to banking. Oh, there's a fixed supply. That's different to banking. All right, I've learned everything I need to know about banking, fractional reserve banking. And so, Bitcoin was like this amazing educational tool that transformed um, people's uh, financial literacy um, on some of the major issues in time for those issues becoming major, major problems. So that's why I always will be eternally grateful for Bitcoin. So when I, when I look at um, fractional reserve banking, that's now widely accepted as the way banking works. But there was a time when uh, it wasn't acknowledged and it was denied. And, you know, it seems that we didn't have a seminal event. It just sort of crept up on us from total denial and conspiracy to widely re accepted fact. Was there a moment that you recognized in the, in, in the broader discourse this was now accepted as a fact? Uh, two, I'd say three, three moments. So, um, in uh, well, firstly, it, it was a fact in economics, but they explained it. They separated money creation and and, bought, and built a whole theory of economics without pretty much ignoring money creation. Whereas Austrian economics focused on money and behaviors as a result of hard money or soft money. Um, but during Lehman, pre Lehman Brothers, if you told someone that banks create money, I actually got chucked out of a lecturer at the London School of Economics for just sounding so conspiracy theory, um, just by explaining exactly how banking works. Um, and uh, But post Lehman Brothers, it was really, you know, the, the, the questions were asked, uh, but it was all about debt and leverage and rather than actually get into the roots of money creation. Uh, then Bitcoin came around, and I think it's not until we start to the Western world and the global world starts to experience the cost of living crisis. Um, the, you know, you get one narrative, which is always oh, Putin and Russia. Um, and then you get another narrative, which is actually during COVID, we, we printed excessive money. So it's when it became real during lockdowns and cost of living crisis that I think it goes further and further down the curve of people asking, what, what is actually happening here? Um, why, why, you know, why, why are these things happening? And I think with the Bitcoin showing an alternative, you, you get a, a narrative. But it was somewhere between, um, you know, Lehman Brothers and, uh, you know, uh, cost, cost of living crisis today, uh, that more and more people, it just became accepted as obvious. And I remember the day I got a tweet from Birkbeck University saying, of course, banks create money. 
Um, but I remember being, you know, ridiculed for saying that um, years, years, years later. So what, once, I think also when England sold off its gold supply, um, people started asking a lot about it as well. Yeah, uh, what's that mean? You know, when 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 a truth is as is finally accepted, it was always thus, and uh, they they yeah, and then we, we get ridiculed years. for saying yeah, it. <laughs> the years of denial are simply forgotten. Hey, let's get into El Salvador. What um. When, when did you first go there? What was your first involvement? Um, so my, well, my first involvement was uh, literally beginning of this year. Um, it, well, towards the end of last year, I uh, found out about the Bitcoin Volcano Bond project. Um, prior to that, I was, when they made it le- legal tender, um, it was just, for me, it was just such a big feat because we'd been trying to do it. We tried in UK, we tried in Isle of Man. Um, and, and really that was done, you know, by um, the Bitcoin Beach, uh, Mike and, you know, the guys. Oh, you had a, I think you had a podcast recently where you bought like the, the Hope House guys and everyone on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that movement um, that was so grounds up uh, and then, you know, Bekele, um, you know, really hyper accelerating it. Um, but I started really when it turned into securities, that's when I get the call. Um, cause I've, I've got more experience in Bitcoin based securities than, than anyone really. So as soon as it was the Bitcoin volcano bond, um, that was, you know, really, I, I'm a complete money geek. So, uh, I, I wanted to just get over straight away, uh, get in the midst of the action and see how I could support with all the experiences that we've had trying to do this for so long. But the whole perception of these volcano bonds, just the name invokes some kind of fantasy <laughs> comic book sort of, you know, we're making money out of uh, lava, basically, the energy that comes out of a volcano. It's, it's a fantastic uh, uh, branding, for example, uh, for, for the, excuse me, it's a fantastic brand that they've put on the actual bonds. And there's been a lot of interest. Every time I mention El Salvador, people are asking me about the volcano bonds, what's happening with them. There have been some delays, but my understanding is that pretty much the investors are committed and as soon as the government has some bandwidth, that they're pretty much ready to go. What can you tell us about what's happening with those? Yeah, so, um, you know, the, I think um, uh, it was announced over ambitiously. There's a shit ton of regulations and things that need to happen. So we went out there. Um, we tried to support the government in understanding some of the regulatory hurdles. Um, there's also geopolitics. So, um, you know, when when I think about why at the at the macro scale, then bring it back to the micro of what's actually happening. You know, at the macro scale, I see Bitcoin as um, Austrian economics on a blockchain, as it were. It's a deleveraging, a movement away from debt to equity. And by equity, I mean, you know, I, I was deep in debt trying to create a bank and then, you know, Bitcoin treated me very well. I became wealthy because of Bitcoin, because I was able to save it. Um, our company, Bank to the Future, we never had any VC funding uh, because we implemented a Bitcoin standard in the company. We made enough dollars to pay our overhead, but we saved in Bitcoin and then Bitcoin was our VC. Um, and so that that same concept at the sovereign level, um, this is the first time we get to actually see that. And so, you know, uh, when I think about Bitcoin, I think about, um, you know, equity, it's uh, creating value, becoming wealthy and then spending that value. Um, whereas the fiat um, system is uh, get in debt, the value of your money goes down. So you have to leverage assets um, and leverage debt. Um, and so you have this over leveraging effect. So when I saw the Bitcoin volcano bond, I thought of it like a debt to equity swap, as it were. Um, and so the in order to do that, you've got lots of enemies in the world. Um, you know, when we tried to make Bitcoin legal tender in the Isle of Man, uh, the Bank of England tried to get in the way of that. Um, when uh, El, uh, Bukele made uh, Bitcoin legal tender in El Salvador, uh, the IMF don't like that at all. Um, and so the easiest way to do is, is ridicule it. Um, and, you know, there's, uh, we'll go into the economics of El Salvador, if you like, the finance side. I know you guys were ground talking about people, which is awesome. Um, look at the economic and finance side. Um, but uh, this really is a very, very scarce, scary concept for currency at a time when fiat currency is most pressured. And that's really easy to ridicule. It's really easy to get conspiracy theories out of. It's really easy to think that will never happen. 
But when you study monetary history, you see that this is way more probable to happen because if you, if you go back long enough. Um, so, you know, that um, Bekele has read his Ray Dalio, he's uh, read his uh, Bitcoin standard safer. Um, he's got the right people along. He's implementing Simon, a long-term Simon, can I just uh, pause you just there? Sorry to break up your, your sure. um, train of thought. I, I don't know if it's me, but you seem to just be breaking up. Could you perhaps move a little bit to get a better data point or something like that? All right, let me do that, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Okay, how's um, this one? You was, yeah, that's perfect. You were sounding so clear and then just suddenly started breaking up. I wonder if it was your end or my end. Yeah, I'm wandering around. That's probably me. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I'm in El um, Salvador now, so. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, that explains it, actually. We'll go into that a little bit later with infrastructure. Hey, you mentioned something really interesting about um, competing pressure points geopolitically. The IMF doesn't like it. Why don't they like it? And what are the, what were the traditional alternatives to what um, El Salvador could have done with, instead of a Bitcoin back bond? Yeah, so, you know, if you look at geopolitics today, um, every single country in the world is over leveraged. They've been on a, you know, a fiat standard. We, um, we moved, we've, we've had all these monetary renegotiations over time since the dollar took over the Great British Pound. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we had, we've had the gradual redesigning a movement away from the gold standard. Um, you had like the, you know, the, the, the Versailles Treaty in 19, um, after the, the first world war where all of the gold of the losing countries, um, was put in debt to the U S that, um, funded much of the war, but didn't get involved in hurting their country that put them in a very strong position. Um, and then they funded the next ways of growth, um, the industrial revolutions. Um, and uh, you moved over to, well, prior to that, you had essentially JP Morgan was the central bank in the 1907 panic. He, he did what FTX is doing today with Bitcoin companies, actually. Um, he uh, lent, lent a lot of money and then bought the banks up for pennies on the dollar. Uh, so then... Everyone met in 1910 in Jekyll Island and J.P. Morgan and various others designed uh, the fractional reserve banking system. And then in 13, you have the next monetary renegotiation where um, fiat money was created through the Fed at the U.S. level. Then you had the war and the war meant that all the gold was transferred to the winning countries. Um, and then you had the Second World War. So then you had Bretton Woods uh, where it said, well, all of you take off your gold standard and peg yourself to the dollar. And then the dollar will promise back itself gold. Um, so then you end in, into a gold standard via the dollar. So, And then finally, in 71, you had the rigging of that agreement um, where uh, the, the gold standard was fully removed and we entered into the massive, massive over leveraging. And then finally, in 2022, you had the US just essentially sanctioning a central bank in Russia, meaning that dollars can now be deleted. Um, so everything that Bitcoin does is kind of been this hundred years of dollar history. Uh, so now all the countries are over leveraged. What choices do they have? Well, they either keep the Ponzi scheme going and issue a central bank digital currency to deleverage their economy. So a central bank digital currency is essentially debt free money issued by the central bank as a force against fractional reserve banking. It's, it's actually a speculative attack, attack on banks. Um, it doesn't do much for Bitcoin other than support it. Um, but it's a speculative attack on fractional reserve banking. It's a deleveraging uh, where you issue a currency by a central bank, not backed by debt. Um, and you'll probably do it when banks go bust at the next overleveraging um, event, you know, the next financial crisis, because we solve the problem with the cause of the problem. And so you either issue a central bank digital currency, which a lot of countries will choose, which is, uh, you know, continuing the Ponzi scheme, lead to more hyperinflation wealth inequality, all of the effects that have, that have happened. Um, or you borrow money from China uh, through a Belt and Road Initiative. So if you look at most of the countries out here, you see a lot of development, but it's funded by China, who's trying to compete with the IMF. Um, or you take, um, if you read a book like uh, John Perkins' Economic Hitman, you take an Economic Hitman loan from the IMF, which is an organization designed to uh, perpetuate the dollar globally after Bretton Woods to get all of the countries deep in dollar debt um, so that they could either um, take over certain public infrastructure or get political weighing uh, when those debts become unrepayable. 
And so if you look at El Salvador, prior to Bukele, you know, we're, it's currently a $30 billion economy that has $23 billion debt. Um, they're looking at a, a restructuring right now. Part of it involves drawing down some special drawing rights from the IMF. Um, uh, lots of initiatives are being funded by um, China relations. Um, China has, you know, wants to be the next superpower economy. Um, and uh, the, you know, the, the trends are, are pointing in that direction. Um, so what we, what, what we think is important here is creating a third choice, a sovereign choice. Um, and while we did the Bitcoin standard on a very you know, small scale as individuals um, and then a smaller scale on companies, um, we think it's uh, vital for every country to take a percentage of their sovereign finance and speculate it on digital hard sound money becoming a success. Um, and really, if you look at the numbers, everyone's criticizing El Salvador. They bought 100 million of Bitcoin. They earned 2,300 on Treasury. It's now worth just under 50 million. Um, people are using, the IMF is using that as a mechanism for saying, well, if you want to borrow money from us, get rid of that Bitcoin policy. Uh, because if this succeeds, and this is what people need to understand, if this succeeds, this is a big problem for the business model of the International Monetary Fund. They are not a bailout company. They are not a, a mechanism for you know, developing the world. They are a mechanism for dollarizing the world and implementing a global central bank digital currency on top of their special drawing rights um, so that they can maintain control um, in the mechanisms. Now, you could call that a conspiracy theory, but I just call it following the money. All you need to do is follow the money in order to get to the root uh, of these things. And so every country that's completely over leveraged has those four choices. I believe if they choose the central bank digital currency route, which many will, we're moving from you know, more to Keynesian communism on a blockchain ways of managing. Um, and every country should hedge some of that in case it gets out of control from their governments um, with some sovereign um, you know, uh, 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 hard money ways of organizing and managing their economy. I think Bitcoin is legal tender and a Bitcoin bond is the perfect mechanism for a political, geopolitical, neutral currency. So I believe every country should have that. And if it succeeds, if El Salvador can successfully raise funds using Bitcoin and create a vastly superior bond um, to their fiat bonds, um, and give investors a higher return over the long term that is put in those with pension reform and everyone in El Salvador through some kind of pension reform. Because the danger with is if you look at an economy like Hong Kong, um, you know, everyone that lived in Hong Kong prior to the property uh, real estate boom um, ended up getting poor and had to leave Hong Kong. Um, and then it just became a mega, mega rich place. I lived in Hong Kong prior to... Uh, uh, moving to El Salvador, uh, moving to sorry, Isle of Man. I haven't moved to El Salvador, um, and so if you can have pension reform, securities reform, and Bitcoin as legal tender, I think if the over the next ten years this plays out the way that I think it will play out, and the way that Bukele thinks it will play out, um, this is one of the most important events in financial history, which is incredibly exciting. Um, and obviously, it's speculative. We've all been through Bitcoin booms and busts. We know the cycles. Uh, we know that, you know, I was there from when it was a room of 50 people um, to where it is today. Um, but betting a percentage um, through risk management of a country's future, um, I believe, is a completely responsible, not irresponsible strategy. Um, and the IMF wants countries to follow irresponsible strategies of fiat-based Ponzi scheme debts uh, because they believe in Keynesian economics. And if you follow the money, it's what maintains the, the vested interests and power struggles that we're receiving today. And China obviously wants to do the same. Um, so let's give everyone a fourth choice. You either issue your own currency, central bank digital currency, um, borrow from America, the IMF, from China Belt and Road, um, or create a, a fourth alternative, a third alternative for borrowing, which is um, using Bitcoin. A responsible country will probably do all and hedge their bets. Mm. It sounds like they're most fearful of a successful example and what that might mean for other similarly positioned countries and perhaps El Salvador. 
could be the first domino to fall. It, it, you got it exactly that. If El Salvador succeeds, this is a fundamental shift in the way that financial markets work. A movement to countries slowly adopting hard money in a time where um, loose money is failing. Um, that is a really, really important life time to be alive in financial history that we are experiencing right now. Um, and to think that it all came from this crazy um, little experiment called Bitcoin is hard for people to believe. And so therefore, it's easier to take the ridicule route. It's easier to just um, say, well, El Salvador has lost 50 uh, million. It's easy to get people in poverty, you know, wound up about that. Um, it's, it's, it's very easy to mock. Um, but we all know the story involved in Bitcoin <laughs> Uh, for any, you know, any period longer than four years, you know, you get completely mocked when the market's going down. Um, and then you get told that you're um, a crazy, it's a Ponzi scheme and it's a scam when the markets go up. Um, and then eventually we always uh, reach new, new, new higher highs because the fundamentals of Bitcoin never change. It's the ability to own your own money, it's the ability to spend your own money, and it's the ability to have a fixed supply. Um, and that doesn't change. And as long as that doesn't change, um, you know, you will get you will get organizations like the IMF that don't want this to succeed. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a, a classic power struggle in a, in a changing, shifting power. Uh, and I think El Salvador is at the front of that. And uh, that's why we're here and we're setting up our, you know, Bitcoin investment banks here, because we think that other countries will want to follow and other countries uh, will want to see that. And I think, you know, you can you can build a new industry. Um, built upon that. That's exciting, really exciting. I think you, you made a really, really good point about the uh, the hype cycle through bull and bear markets, because I mean, I've only been invested in Bitcoin just under two years, and uh, I've been able to tap into the cumulative wisdom of uh, the Bitcoin crowd. And so when I see prices falling, I don't panic at all. My appetite for Bitcoin only increases. So I've got the Bitcoin crowd, the, the community to thank for for imparting, you know, their uh, accumulated experience over many bull and bear cycles as well. Um, can we touch on, uh, well, getting to some of the details around the Bitcoin bond? Uh, let I think the number that was floated around initially was something in the order of a billion dollars. Um, let's say that's, you know, fully subscribed and successful. What is the country going to do with those funds? Because we know we, we call it Bitcoin-backed bonds, but really what are they going to do with that money? Are they just going to buy Bitcoin? We know that's not the case. What are they going to do? Uh, yeah, so this, was a, um, this, this project was constructed um, by um, Blockstream. And so mm -hmm. I was, um, I, I, I've been involved, but I wasn't responsible for the design. But the design um, is that uh, half of it is going to be invested in Bitcoin. And the other half is going to start the building, the infrastructure. Um, sorry, and, Simon, uh, you just... You know, sorry, it's not... Uh, it, you know. Oh, have you lost me? Uh, just now. Yeah. Well, first you were breaking up and then I got a call. Okay. <laughs> so go ahead. The first half was going where? Sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I, I can't talk about the, the actual design mm. because, um, you know, the, it could be, end up being designed differently. Okay. Um, but the original iteration was that um, half of it will go into uh, Bitcoin mining, the other half will go into funding infrastructure um, and, uh, yeah, and the creation of Bitcoin City. And we'll need to have further funding around the complete project. OK. Um, OK, so the aim is to generate... Um generate enough revenue from uh, the Bitcoin mining to service the bond to investors. Is that right? Design one. I would design it slightly differently. Okay. All right. And so what's your involvement with the bond from this point onwards then? Uh, so, you know, um, the, the, the broker is Bitfinex, which for all disclosure, I'm, I'm a shareholder in. Mm -hmm. um through the the project when we um in, in their time of need um and uh yeah so we we would look to we have many investors and many retirement plans that um uh, to the future that hold bitcoin um and also uh want to hold securities so this would be one of the securities to help it from a liquidity perspective 
Um, and uh, also from a regulatory compliance stroke design perspective, we're forecasting many attack vectors. Uh, and so the, the reason the project was slowed on a bit is obviously El Salvador had um, its most important was um, on some of the gangs and crime situation. Um, and uh, the, so, but there's also securities laws that need to be upgraded um, in order to support this exciting new thing. And that's where, I, that's where really I come in. Um, I like, uh, we've, I've had a lot of experience at changing securities laws um, in order to support financial innovation in the fintech industry and the Bitcoin industry. Um, so let, let's get good securities laws. Let's get the, the license and regulatory structure right. So um, it's more, uh, you know, robust from attack vectors uh, because there will be a lot of attack vectors. So the the securities are they're going to sorry the uh, the bonds are going to be issued in El Salvador. So you're looking to implement laws in El Salvador to accommodate that. Is that have I understood you correctly? Yeah, we're we're looking. So you know, Bekele wanted to do some um, various law reforms, um, lots of different types, um, and uh, you know, we've been as been providing as much value as we can in order to support that. Mm -hmm. uh, we're okay. also applying for a license ourselves there, so. Oh, like to operate as a bank? Um, a investment bank as opposed to a, an investment bank and a brokerage. We don't do um, deposit taking or anything like that. Um, we're involved in, you know, debt and equity markets in investment banking as opposed to um, deposit taking. Oh, okay. Uh, look, um, I wanted to move on to another topic. Was there anything else that you want to say about the Bitcoin bonds before we move on? Uh, no, we can move to the next topic. Oh, one last question. When will they be issued, do you think? Or what's the timeline for that? Because uh, the delay is uh, top of mind for a lot of people. And even people yeah. who are not interested in investing were interested in the topic to see uh, El Salvador progress with this. Um, what's the uh, time frame looking like? Um, so I, I don't like to second guess governments and regulators. I've been doing that for years and um, it's always been given egg on my face because there's just an infinite number of things. Um, El Salvador is one of the first um, governments I've ever worked with that can operate at faster than promised sometimes. Um, but inevitably, new agendas and goals get in the way and you have to prioritize what's right for your country. Um, but I believe that um, we're on the crisp or, you know, we're on the, or something should be happening uh, fairly soon. Uh, famous last words. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes. This project is not forgotten. Um, and uh, I think it's, uh, it's timed a little bit better. Um, I think it would have been a bit harsher at the top of the market um, rather than this interesting time when you get the diehards. Um, I always like these markets when, um, you know, the people that are in it just for the quick bucks disappear and you get building. Uh, th these are the good times to, to really work on foundational projects, I think. Yeah, there's quite a lot of excitement and it's really easy to get swept up in all of that during the bull markets. And uh, once uh, that hype sort of dies down, you uh, definitely focus on more on yeah, the future, one, actually, what we want to do in the next two, three, four years. And, and I'm personally thinking about that and how I'm positioned. So I can imagine people with far more uh, important infrastructure concerns regarding their countries and um yeah, if someone different. wants, um, sorry, uh, if someone wants um, updates on that, there's, um, we created a landing page where we'll, as soon as something changes, we'll notify you. Uh, that's retirementplanb.com uh, forward slash bond, B-O-N-D. Um, that that web page, you can just enter your email and then um, we'll, as soon as anything changes, we'll email you. And, and that's uh, affiliated with your bank. Your bank owns that, right? Yeah, so um, Bank to the Future has two brands. It's um, banktothefuture.com. It's not a bank. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a securities broker. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the other is um, retirementplanb.com. That's our retirement product that allows people to hold Bitcoin um, securities in a retirement plan. Okay. Um, let's move on then. There's another thing that sort of caught my attention uh, in the last couple of weeks, and that's the $6 billion in Bitcoin investment into El Salvador. Now, at first glance, that seems quite an amazing number and quite a fantastic number, given El Salvador's GDP is uh, around about $30 billion. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, this one's been taken slightly out of context. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this relates to um, a couple of projects that we're working on. One is we're doing 
um, a restructuring uh, for the distressed Bitcoin lending market at the moment. Um, and our announcement was that um, we uh, put together a syndicate of six billion in order to um, support this restructuring project. Um, and that, that's another project that we were working on. Um, and then we said that um, we're actually going to be um, launching a, a brokerage and a new license in El Salvador. Um, and then um, these are the bits where I'm under NDA. Um, you know, if, uh, if certain distressed assets make their way um, to that, uh, then, yeah, it's not, it's not that it's direct investment into um, infrastructure in El Salvador or anything like that. Um, it's more that 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 would be the the types of numbers that we're working on right now. Um, so I think language barriers may have misconstrued exactly what that means. So what are, what are we talking about? We're talking about. Um, I'm I'm trying to understand the nature of this particular project. Um, so there's what I've understood so far is that you're looking to put together a package for distressed. A recovery uh, so, plan for distressed lenders. And what would that be conditioned on that they locate to El Salvador? How, what's El Salvador got to do with um, that? I don't understand. No, the, 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 uh, the connection to El Salvador is that company would be licensed and incorporated in El Salvador. And we'd look to move uh -huh. um, certain parts of our Bank to the Future infrastructure over to um, El Salvador to facilitate that type of investments. Okay. All right. So essentially, you'd be operating from El Salvador with respect to these recovery plans and those funds, $6 billion worth of Bitcoin for distressed Bitcoin lenders, where will that come from? Um, so again, the, I, I probably need to go a deep, bit deeper into that, that project in order to um, understand where those numbers came from. Um, and it's a whole other story if you want to go into it. Yeah, I'd be um, happy to. Okay. Um, so when we started to experience some of the distressed lenders and full disclosure, I'm an equity holder and um, depositor at some of those distressed lenders. Um, I put a small percentage of my Bitcoins into securing a Bitcoin loan and then put more in in order to pay the interest on that loan so I didn't need to sell my Bitcoin. Um, and so when those, uh, when those companies became um, distressed, um, we looked at doing a similar type of uh, infrastructure restructuring like we did with Bitfinex when Bitfinex um, was essentially um, insolvent. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're exploring um, that right now. The numbers uh, come out of that and we put together a syndicate if we needed to implement a free market um, bailout solution, similar to what happened with Lehman Brothers. Essentially, they ended up getting acquired um, by... Uh, Barclays Bank and the Mura Bank uh, because they didn't get a government bailout. And so a free market solution was implemented instead. Um, and they went into Chapter 11, much like the distressed companies that are in Chapter 11 right now. So we were working on a reorg. And in order to um, be backed by the, the funding, we put together a syndicate of uh, $6 billion. Um, and then the combined um, amounts of assets that are under distressed um, come out around about those numbers as well. Uh, but there's lots of good loans in, within, the, within those projects as well that are backed by pristine collateral like Bitcoin. Um, the problem is uh, many of the, the loans that are backed by shitcoin collateral um, is, is the problem, really. Um, mm. So, yeah. Would you be able to do that before the raft of, um, I guess, uh, regulations that um, El Salvador needs to introduce for their Bitcoin bonds? Would you be able to do that before that? Well, remember, we've been at this problem for a decade now. So we've got we, we are regulated securities business, both um, we have a US broker dealer, we have a, we're regulated by Cayman Islands Monetary Authority, and we're making some announcements around uh, many of the um, lending licenses and money transmitters and various other things in the months ahead. Um, so yeah, we and also the work that we're doing in El Salvador, it's kind of perfect timing. Um, in order to have the perfect storm and really El Salvador be at the birth of a really important industry. You know, when, when I look at uh, my Bitcoin history, there were certain moments when Bitcoin was really going to fail and it didn't. And one of those was Mt. Gox. And, you know, that that's still trying to be resolved today because it went through Japanese traditional bankruptcy proceedings. Um, and people had to fight to try and get their Bitcoin rather than it being liquidated on the market. Um, and, uh, you know, that was that process. The second one was prior to the 2017 bull market, we had the Bitfinex disaster that, 
if we hadn't restructured and that successfully worked out, uh, then it, it may not have gone into a bull market so early. Um, and I do believe right now we're in a moment where um, there are billions of Bitcoin um, locked up in these distressed companies. They're in Chapter 11 bankruptcy, which means that um, they can reorganize, um, just like the type of solutions that we did with Bitfinex, but this time through the US court system, because Bitfinex was a British Virgin Island company, so it didn't go through US bankruptcy proceedings. Uh, this is our first one through US bankruptcy proceedings. Um, but if that doesn't get reorganized, there's um, billions and billions of Bitcoin that's going to be dumped onto the market, um, which will then cause issues into, you know, the knock on effects of other distressed exchanges that I believe operate off fractional reserve models illegally um, and uh, Bitcoin miners, which are suffering right now. Um, and so if we can reorganize. Um, then I think we can replicate a similar success story like we did with Bitfinex leading to another bull market. Um, if it moves into what's called Chapter 7 bankruptcy, um, then all of those Bitcoins might need to be dumped on the market, uh, which could cause the next phase of cascading liquidations and further distress. And my personal belief is there was a lot of fraud and misrepresentations involved in these uh, distressed lenders. And I just quite frankly don't want that multiple billions of losses to occur um, because I think that would be uh, a lot of people were misled into, um, you know, into the safety of those products. Um, so I'm really motivated to try and um, see if we can get a restructuring reorg uh, to prevent the, that problem. Mm, so the, the recovery plans that we're talking about, they're dependent on court procedures? Yeah, so the, you have to demonstrate compliance to the US courts and uh, it has to be a feasible plan. Um, and so, um, thankfully, we've been working on, you know, um, Bitcoin based and uh, equity securities and stuff for the last decade. So um, we think we're in a position to be able to put forward a compliant plan that could get a sign off from the courts in order to prevent uh, prevent that problem. And uh, again, a shift from debt to equity. Um, so we'd look to do it more of a bail in structure rather than a bailout. Um, where uh, the, the, those victims, they get what assets they had and the rest is made up with uh, an equity position uh, in this company. And that company, a big part of it could be in El Salvador and El Salvador could be part of the growth of an industry because they've implemented the laws uh, for legal tender and uh, Bitcoin-based securities um, that could make, this, uh, could make this happen in conjunction with all the, the, the other global regulatory structures we have. Hmm. What is what are the odds of um, uh, an industry being seeded in El Salvador? Um, it's very speculative, but um, that's exactly what we're doing. Um, so we're looking. We're currently hiring here. Um, we're uh, looking at several companies. We've got our HR team out here. Um, we're building our office out here, and we'd like we've put together you know educational programs for much of the experience of um, Bitcoin-based investment banking that we built over the last decade. And, uh, you know, we, we, there's lots and lots of people that um, have been involved in financial services in the U.S. that are now coming back to El Salvador uh, because they feel safety in their country and they're reuniting with their families. Um, and so we've got a really nice blend of experience that's come from, you know, very developed U.S. financial services markets that's come back. Um, they, it's more affordable where they live um, and uh, that experience can be applied. We can give them all of the Bitcoin knowledge and securities knowledge that we built. And also um, those that want to work um, and really just learn from the ground up that are willing to work hard and be a part of a new industry. And I, and I think El Salvador in its current state is absolutely way ahead, years ahead of any other country to take advantage of that opportunity. And the whole world is watching El Salvador. So if El Salvador does it and it works, um, if the industry um, successfully restructures from El Salvador, then why wouldn't all the other countries want to come to El Salvador to gain some of that expertise um, that, they've, that they've built and a new industry could be born? Yeah, so, you know, I returned almost two weeks ago from El Salvador and gave my experience. But, you know, my, my primary lens was as a visiting tourist who went to see a few things on the ground, like, you know, classrooms and shops and that sort of thing, particularly in Elzonde Beach and a few other sort of outreach um, touch points that we had. 
But from a business point of view, I guess, can you give us an assessment of El Salvador as you see it right now? Um, some, I guess, opportunities for the country to progress further and what are some of the challenges that you see for them? Yeah, so I see, look, you've got, when, when I think about my journey in Bitcoin, I always break it down into three. Um, and, you know, you've got individuals, you've got companies and you've got sovereigns. Um, I think the, the individual movement as Bitcoin is legal tender um, is, you know, it's, it's the road has hit, you know, the, it started. Um, so they've, they've, they've made it legal tender um, wherever you go. You know, all the things that you covered in previous podcasts, you know, where, that you experienced. Um, the, I, I'm on the ground here as well. And what I, what a, a commitment that I made while I'm on the ground is that whenever um, someone allows me to pay in Bitcoin, I'll sit down with them and go through some Bitcoin risk management strategies. Um, so how to manage it as an individual. And what I walk them through is helping them understand what money is. So they've been used to fiat money. And in fiat money, in, in a country, you know, with this, uh, with the lack of opportunity that they had recovering from wars, the IMF, poverty, all sorts of things, um, then they only know spending. Um, and I tell them there's, there's four parts of money. And what I'd like you to do is put together a, not a one-year plan. I'd like you to put together a 10-year plan. And here's what a 10-year plan looks like. Um, firstly, understand how to spend in Bitcoin and accept Bitcoin payments. Um, and once you get past spending, um, your job, however it is, and I understand it's hard, there's inflation. You know, um, I don't understand your situation like my situation. But here's the truth. Here's the reality. There's only one way to get out of poverty, and that's to spend less than you earn and, um, and be able to save. And so I don't know how to achieve that for you. Um, but you've got a business here that's accepting Bitcoin. If you can figure out how to have a margin where you can put, you know, a percentage side, then you move it to the second phase of money, which is called savings. Now, in the savings world, we're used to fiat currency where money goes down and you have to speculate it in real estate in order to beat inflation. But now you have hard money. If you've got a 10 year plan, then your savings can be a percentage of it in Bitcoin. And if the, you know, if the future does go, if, if, if some of the things that we think are going to happen do happen, then a percentage of that could then go to the third phase, which is investing. And investing can only be done with savings. Most people in the fiat world, they leverage debt in order to invest. And so you go deeper in debt in order to speculate. In a hard money world, you have spending. You spend less than you earn invest the difference, which creates savings. When you have savings, you create wealth. And when you have wealth, you can invest because it gives you a higher return, but you have to risk losing it. Um, and then finally, if your investing goes well, then you go to the next phase, which is contribution, where you can give to others and contribute outside your own. And so I try to sit down with individuals. If they accept Bitcoin, I'll give them work through some numbers with them and help them understand whether they could. You know, I tell people that most people vastly underestimate or overestimate what they can do in one year and end up investing in get rich quick schemes and selling it too early as we've seen with many people but they underestimate what they can do in a decade and so i'd like to put together a decade-long plan um, so that's the individual level but i think the key opportunity is at the sovereign level um, and that but if you can bring your population with you which is why the corporate level is very important as well because those that have jobs and those that have businesses, um, if they can also you know, prevent the Hong Kong situation where they get crowded out by the billionaires that invested in all the real estate from China, but if they can all own Bitcoin and they can understand those principles and they can get past that, that poverty line, um, then if the government successfully executes this strategy and companies implement Bitcoin-based retirement plans, um, then a whole country could be lifted if Bitcoin succeeds, and I'm not talking about betting 100% of the country on it, you know, we, the, the ratio, we got a $30 billion economy with $23 billion of debt um, and, uh, you know, $100 million in Bitcoin on Treasury. So these are very responsible numbers at the moment, um, even though the, the headlines is trying to make it as they're about to default on their debt because of the Bitcoin strategy. It's all BS. It's all complete IMF propaganda. Um, <clears throat> but... If at the sovereign level, um, they can implement, uh, you know, it, they can implement that, hold it on treasury and show people that this, this works in the long term, um, it's risky. It works in the long term. 
uh, then, uh, you know, you get the opportunity to lift um, and, and create a, a, a new thing. So I, I think it's, to me, as long as um, Bikeli stays on this track um, and uh, individuals, uh, you know, keep, um, don't get caught up in the, in, the, in the negativity and propaganda, and they can see it on the ground. When, you, when you're here, every single person I have spoken to that I've sat down and gone through that risk management strategy, you know, and, 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 and trying to help them with financial education. Those conversations only happen because of Bitcoin. We would never have been in a position to have that conversation if it wasn't for Bitcoin and trying to help people understand that hard money is different to fiat money. But they know it because they got their fiat money, they got their hard money, they can see the cost of living is killing them in fiat money. And at the moment, Bitcoin is killing them if they try to use it as a currency. Um, but if they can see over the next four years, five years, six years, um, what impact that will have, uh, I think it's, um, it's just such an interesting um, and, and, quite frankly, very rewarding thing that the Bitcoin community um, can be involved in. And we just got to do what we've always done at Bitcoin. It, you know, ignore the FUD, um, keep building, keep supporting and stay on ethics and stay on track and, uh, you know, uh, g g connect ourselves with a, sen a greater sense of purpose of what digital hard sound money can mean to the world and not get caught up in confusing what it means to a country that has all of the resources in the world versus what it means to a country that has very little resources, very little banking penetration, um, and, you know, has been stuck in, in um, a gang-led country for a long time. And if you speak to them, you know, these people feel like, well, this is the first time I've been able to have the freedom to be able to save. I've had the freedom to be able to build my business and feel safe. Um, and now I can start thinking about saving and investing. I didn't think of it like that. I've never had that kind of educational um, opportunity. Uh, but Bitcoin does that. It's, a, it's an education in the most important monetary trends in the world. And that's what I think the true beauty of Bitcoin is. So that's, um, uh, thank you for that, um, first of all. But uh, that's an excellent uh, summary of what's happening there on the ground. My experience also with adoption was that brand awareness or the awareness of Bitcoin and what it is was almost sort of universal, unanimous. Um, and, you know, with I was there with uh, the crypto couple and Walker when he um asked people if he could tip them in bitcoin we we only had one person who <laughs> refused it and that's because he was a he was a technical luddite he just refused to, to to download a wallet but everybody else was very receptive so it, the awareness of what bitcoin is is near universal um from what we experienced there what's been your experience in talking to people or even just raising it as a topic Oh, every, yeah, ev everyone I've spoken to um, knows what Bitcoin is. Uh, that's a great start. Um, everyone, the, uh, every business um, that I've spoken to um, had an app. Um, and every taxi driver I've spoken to, every, every person I've spoken to um, has an app. Um, they're missing the educational piece of, of what this is. Um, you know, and, uh, and and that's that's the job. The the job of this is the is the educational piece of helping people understand that um, trying to get through those different phases of money and the hard money as savings. Um, you know, it, it, we've we're used to a world where investing is a substitute to saving, and you skip the saving part because money is so shit. Mm. Um, where, where, and, sorry, but, Simon, where are you spending yeah. most of your time, though? Uh, I'm I'm currently in, uh, you know, I've done the typical thing because I've been here before. So I did, um, but I'm, I'm purely on government meetings, back to back meetings in um, San Salvador. And every hour I've got a new place I've got to be. So um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm heavy in business mode at the moment as opposed to tourist mode. But over the weekend, I did make it down to, um, uh, you know, Bitcoin Beach and climb up some of the volcanoes, um, local ones. Um, and, and just try and speak to people wherever I can, wherever I've got a free moment, really. Uh, but I yeah. haven't gone further out yet. I haven't. Um, that's not this trip. Maybe next trip. 
So uh, I guess for, for the interest of balance, I did have someone who was on one of my other spaces and he'd traveled a little bit more around El Salvador. And we should yeah. note that, you know, like that's this is the metropolitan experience that we're conveying. El Zonte Beach is basically Bitcoin central. And then San Salvador is, a, you know, it's a fairly, fairly decent sized city. Outside in, once you get to some of the more rural towns and, you know, naturally that sort of adoption and awareness is not going to be as saturated. And, you know, we had someone who shared their experience of people not really knowing what he was asking for when he asked about Bitcoin. So that is still, you know, prevalent there in some of the more remote areas. But, uh, you know, the experience when in San Salvador, El Zonte Beach, it's pretty much unanimous what it was in my experience as well um i wanted to ask you um your view on infrastructure there and you you said that you've been there a few times so can you have you noticed any changes and progress and can you tell us a little bit about those yeah last time i was here um uh, i was at a launch um with um max stacy and bekele for um, a new library that was um, being constructed um, and since I've got here, I've noticed a few more hospitals popping up. Um, some of the roads are still pretty rough. Um, I haven't, you know, again, I, you, you, you're quite right. Um, I'm giving you the metropolitan experience. I, I, I can't tell you about the other experience um, because I've just been in business mode um, while here. And I think that's um, perfectly fine as well, because, you know, we're talking about the start of something. We're not saying that the entire country is saturated with Bitcoin and, you know, people are walking around with, um, you know, infinity divided by 21 million T-shirts and insignias. It, it's not like that at all. But, there, you know, it's the beginning of the journey towards Bitcoin adoption throughout the whole country. And yeah, awareness and is the first step. Yeah, and uh, it, it certainly is awareness step is education but you know even in traditional world we how, how many people have in the traditional developed world how many people have a well-defined financial plan where they spend less than they earn and they have a set percentage of their income that they set aside for investing that they put into a well-defined retirement plan where they've modeled out what they think the expectation of retirement would be um, and they risk manage it with all of the amazing financial products um, with debt, equity, real estate, you know, derivatives, whatever products you can have for hedging. Um, nobody does that. They just open a Fidelity account and hand it over to fund managers. Um, so what we're expecting here, you know, and how many people, if you go into a shop and pay by card, and if you explain to them, oh, did you know money to create because somebody else took on debt? which was backed by real estate, which is a Ponzi scheme through mortgage-backed securities, where the Federal Reserve, um, they pushed it, to create a bank to create it, so that they could leverage and multiply their assets. And then that money went round through a fractional reserve system that then allowed you to multiply it. And it went from the retail bank to the investment bank that created this mortgage-backed security. It was hedged by a credit for swap. Um, and then that deleveraged some of the risk, but they had to put some effects transactions in there in order to make that happen, which is then go back to a database called Swift, which is a message service with three different counterparties in the middle that allow that transaction to happen. Fiat money is effing complicated, you know, and people don't know that. And that's what, that's what you know, people, the, the thing with this new innovation is there was a time, I remember when I was in Vietnam, I'm giving an early presentation in like 2013. Um, and I was on same stage a bunch of bad. Oh, I mean you're just breaking up again. It's getting it's couch. getting quite bad. Sorry, Simon, I mean, can you hear me? You're just oh, breaking up damn. a little bit. It's getting quite bad. Okay. Can you hear me well, now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's much better. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um yeah, sorry, I, I took a bit of a tangent, but I was in a conference I remember in twenty thirteen in Vietnam. Um I think it was with Tone Vase, if I remember correctly, and Roger Ver at the time. Um and uh there was a bunch of bankers trying to persuade all these people to put their cash in a bank. Um, and they were very skeptical about it. And they had to explain why it's uh, what happens when it's at a bank. And, you know, that's the same thing with Bitcoin. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an educational process, even teaching people how money works. This is why, like, I'm, I'm writing my next book right now um, to just help individuals, companies and countries 
understand these concepts because we've got this new experiment called hard money, digital hard sound money. You can reset your education and, and stop just handing that over to, you know, professionals that don't have your best interests that skim fees um, and invest in this Ponzi scheme and, and take self-control. That's what we're trying to do. But throughout history, that's a hard mission to to accomplish without Bitcoin. So this is why it requires the collective intelligence of all of our companies, individuals, and just getting on the ground here, speaking with people. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the work, that's why I love this community. It's, it's created a global movement where people are financially incentivized by savings um, and, and just really on a mission that's given, it gave me hope in my darkest moment when I discovered Bitcoin. Um, and I think that um, it can do that for a lot more people now. Mm. And um, what's your um, observations of uh, sort of infrastructure in the time that you've been going to El Salvador? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've seen improvements, um, but then, you know, I'm in San Salvador. I've seen a few more hospitals um, pop up. Um, and uh, the main thing is when I speak to every taxi driver I try to speak to, every speak to is they say, yeah, in from 2019, um, how long have you been doing this for? Well, I was uh, over eight years, but I've been able to really get lost for you. Uh, I think the losing you again is the big thing. Is, is getting out the entrepreneurial spirit. Oh, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, can. So it always uh, fixes itself okay. up immediately. <laughs> You're moving around still. Okay. Yeah, I find the internet um, is just yeah, in and when, out. When... No, I'm not moving. I'm, I'm still. Uh, uh, uh... <laughs> No, I guess that's the, that's a commentary on the infrastructure anyway, in and of itself. I think that's very <laughs> profound. Yeah, that, there we go. <laughs> yeah, that was one of the things that we noticed. I mean, look, let's let's not um, sugarcoat this at all. El Salvador is a poor country. Yeah, this is an opportunity for the country to rise up off its knees and make something of itself, get away from the debt, and make an investment in something that is going to appreciate long term and help them build. Um, the infrastructure of the country and um, get away from the debt driven cycle that they've been under for so long. Um, but the momentum, the the rate of change from where they are is what gives people hope. That's what gives people so much enthusiasm for what Bitcoin is doing for the country. People are asking, yeah, but they're poor now. They can't afford to wait five or 10 years. And I agree with that. I have a lot of sympathy with that view. How, how does Bitcoin alleviate their poverty now? It's not going to alleviate their poverty, but we do have government ministers tweeting about or attributing the success of their tourism growth and economic growth um, to Bitcoin. And, you know, I went to El Salvador just as one example, simply because it, it was on the radar due to Bitcoin. Uh, Simon's doing business there now. Because of Bitcoin, Max and Stacy moved there because of Bitcoin, and these are not just isolated examples. Um, there are a lot of people who are going to El Salvador because of Bitcoin remittances. Um, they're starting to keep more of that now because more and more people are using Bitcoin instead of through Western Union and other extortionate services that take ten, twenty, thirty percent off. So that they are the ways in which bitcoin is helping now when you signal to the market and to the world that you're a forward looking country and you take tangible steps in that direction through a bitcoin investment making it legal tender which is quite a bold and courageous thing to do you signal to everybody that hey something special is about to happen in this country and it excites people they want to get involved and people like me who'd never otherwise would have thought of visiting El Salvador, go there and spend a week and, you know, quite a sum of money as well, which I was happy to do, and come away with a fantastic experience to share with, you know, a million followers on Twitter. And so hopefully some of you will go to El Salvador as well. So in the immediate sense, that's what I see Bitcoin doing. Um, Simon, yeah, and that's... Um... That's where you know, I, I do want to comment on that because, look, it, it's really important to say I, I totally um, it's so easy for me as a white English male born into a country that was the last empire um, to come here and tell people, oh, yeah, you need to save. You know, that's a that's an outlandish statement. It's insensitive. Um, it's not it's not 
excuse me, it's not reflective of the reality of the of of people that have lived here. And I I, I know that um, this is an educational experience for me. Um, but what 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 I can say is that a lot of poverty, I believe, from me studying um, monetary history over the last twenty years and following the money, um, comes from a country monetary system. Um, and so, you know, uh, the the way to get out of poverty in a country deep in debt with a a, a fiat monetary system, which is everywhere. Um, is to have part of it where a government can implement a hard monetary system. Um, and if a government can become wealthy, it can um, support infrastructure projects that generates more wealth, creates more jobs. It's not purely Austrian. I do believe there is a role for government, especially when you're coming out of a debt burdened, you know, uh, you know, uh, system at the moment. There is a role for government in that. And so the best thing the government can do is create as become as wealthy as it can become um, in the long term because the government can um, fight, the, you know, it, it can fight some of the net repayment it needs to do and invest in hard money instead. You know, one of the key concepts of financial freedom is paying yourself first. When I was deep in debt, I had to just take my debt and not pay it and put a percentage into Bitcoin. I happened to buy it at three dollars. Um, I was on the right side of a trend. Um, but I, I went through all the shit. You know, I saw my Bitcoin crash from $30 to $3, $1,250 to $250, uh, $20,000 to $3,000, $69,000 to uh, $21,000. Um, I've been through those. And it's easier to do if you, if you have savings. Um, so the first cycle is how do you break that cycle of spending less than you earn investments? And for some people in their reality, it's important. Therefore, you need to rely upon the government creating a monetary system that harnesses and supports the free spirit of individuals um, and operation on great opportunities, great jobs where people can save. Um, and how you break that cycle is very, very difficult, especially when you've got a country that was run by gangsters um, and in other countries run by gangsters like the United States and um, the United Kingdom as well. Um, they're just different gangsters. They're more sophisticated and they wear suits. Um, and so how you break that cycle is the challenge that we as Bitcoiners, I think, um, get to work upon um, and put all of our collective intelligent knowledge, effort, skills, art, creativity, which is what I've seen in Bitcoin, just this creative movement of people um, that are, you know, innovating on top of this and putting the best work forward, whether it's giving, whether it's charity, whether it's entrepreneurship, whether it's building. It comes with scammers, it comes with um, fraudsters, it comes with everything that's bad in the world. We can't share it. Um, but it's here. And the country has taken advantage of that opportunity. The, you know, the mimic, the, the, the ridicule of the world and the most powerful interests in the world. And as a president, standing up for that. Satoshi Nakamoto created this. Um, we're only going to get this moment once in history, and this is a moment in financial history um, that I think we should all be you know, contributing what we can to in, in a time when there's some really, really bad shit happening in the fiat currency world right now. Like That is creating a lot of poverty, and how that transition happens, we're going to change trends. The world is cyclical. Um, you know, poor, rich, poor divides happen, inequality happens. But does that mean that we shouldn't try and work on, on changing that just because we know we'll fail? I don't think so. I think we should try and make a difference in our circle of influence with the tools and the resources that we have. And El Salvador is such an exciting opportunity um, that I'm willing to, to get over here and change everything I've been working on for the last decade uh, to try and see that impact in the world. Absolutely. Hey, one last thing I wanted to ask you about is um, the ambassador of El Salvador to the United States tweeted about meeting with Invest Saudi. And they, she said that they asked her to send the five largest projects in that country with social projection. I, I assume that means uh, social impact in translation. Have you heard about that? And um, yeah, I'd be interested in your comments on that. Yeah, I mean, I've seen the same things that you've seen. So I've, I've had meetings um, and uh, seen those tweets. And, uh, you know, these are all uh, projects that happen 
and um, she put the Bank to the Future project in there, which I was humbled and our team was very happy to see. Um, but I, I, I don't have any further details uh, on that. Um, I've, I've really been working on the, rather than the investing side, I've just been working on the financial infrastructure, restructuring, um, and the security side. That's where I've been putting all my energy into right now. Once that comes, watch the, you know, if you, right, that is the US success story. That is the Dutch empire success story. They created capitalism, created financial they created the markets. And, uh, they used all that money in cheap Britain. Oh, building okay. the British Empire and being shipped with what they did from the Dutch Empire and built capital markets, built securities. Uh, uh, was it cutting out? Yeah, you're cutting yeah. out, mate. Built securities and US did the same with Silicon Valley and Wall Street. Yeah. So I'm, um, one last thing, and I know we've been running for just over an hour, so I really do appreciate your time. Um, real estate. Do you have a view on buying real estate in um, El Salvador? Because I know a lot of people, that's the two most asked questions. Um, well, three. Is it safe? <laughs> Is it safe? Volcano mm -hmm. bonds and property investment. So do you have a view on property investment in El Salvador? Um, so firstly, property investment in general. I think that Real estate is a function of um, fiat currency. So real estate goes up uh, the more fiat currency that's created because it's the bank's favorite mechanism for fractional reserve banking. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, under a central bank digital currency, that may not be the case. So um, if you shift to hard money and central bank digital currency, um, I think that's bearish for real estate in general, macro, whole world, global. Um, now, do I think that that's uh, going to happen? I think those trends are going to happen. Um, but traditionally, um, if you want to invest in a country that's growing, um, real estate is people's favorite mechanism. Um, I personally am not a real estate investor, so I'm not the best person to ask. I, I bought my house outright to live in, um, and I don't really invest in real estate because it's... And it's uh, but uh, traditionally, every country that's gone through a boom cycle um, they would invest in that real estate. Now, I haven't spent any time studying the laws, property laws, um, or any of that stuff. So my guess is that um, from what I can see, you know, they've got a pretty robust structure, but I, I just don't think I could comment and give someone some good diligence on that because I haven't tried to buy anywhere yet. Oh, fair enough. Okay. I was hoping for a more personal answer, but uh, you can't get rid of the banker, can you? <laughs> um, yeah. Simon, I really do appreciate your time. Uh, you've given us some great information and really good getting to know your background as well uh, i didn't know you were that much of an og you go way back three dollars bloody hell <laughs> yeah. um thanks again for coming on the show really appreciate it okay awesome thanks for having me and thanks for your work um i really appreciate educational work and uh, uh you coming over to el salvador sharing your experiences and doing the on the ground work because that's really important work as well. And the educational piece, I, I really think, is the key piece. So well done for creating these spaces and nice to meet everybody. Thanks, Simon. And uh, we'll do this again soon. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for Bye -bye. tuning in.